I remember uh, reading an article when I was about 12 years old, I think it might have been in Scientific American, where they measured the efficiency of locomotion for all these species on planet Earth. Uh, how many kilocalories did they expend to get from point A to point B? And the condor one uh, came in at the top of the list, uh, surpassed everything else, and humans came in about a third of the way down the list, which was not such a great showing for the crown of creation. And, uh, but somebody there had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human riding a bicycle. Human riding a bicycle blew away the condor, all the way off the top of the list. And it, it made a really big impression on me that we humans are tool builders, and that we can fashion tools that amplify these inherent abilities that we have to spectacular magnitudes. And so for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind. Uh, something that, that takes us far beyond our inherent abilities. And uh, I think we're just at the early stages of this tool, very early stages, and we've come only a very short distance, and it's still in its formation, but already we've seen enormous changes. I think that's nothing compared to what's coming in the next hundred years. In, in program six, we're going to look at some of the past predictions of why people have been so wrong about the future. Uh -huh. And one of the notions is, is that today's vision of a standalone computer is just as limited as those past visions of it being only a number cruncher. Uh -huh. What's the difference philosophically between a network machine and a standalone machine? Um, let me answer that question in a slightly different way. <clears throat> there have been, if you look at why the majority of people have bought these things so far, uh, there have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one uh, really happened in 1977, and it was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra, who ran the company that marketed the first spreadsheet, walked into my office at Apple one day and pulled out this disk from his uh, vest pocket and said, I, I have this incredible new program. I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really drove, propelled the Apple II to, to the success it, it achieved more than any other single event. And, and with uh, the invention of Lotus 123, and I think it was 1982, that's what really propelled the IBM PC to the level of success that it achieved. So that was the first explosion, was the spreadsheet. The, the, the second really big explosion in our, our industry has been desktop publishing. It happened in 1985 with the Macintosh and the LaserWriter printer. And at that point, people could start to do on their desktops things that only typesetters and printers could do prior to that. And that's been a very big revolution in publishing. And those have re really, those two explosions have been the only two real major revolutions which have caused mo a lot of people to buy these things and use them. Uh, the third one is starting to happen now. And the third one is, let's do for human-to-human -human communication what spreadsheets did for financial planning and what pub desktop publishing did for publishing. Let's revolutionize it using these desktop devices. And we're already starting to see the signs of that. As an example, in an organization, we're starting to see that as business conditions change faster and faster with each year, uh, we cannot change our management hierarchical organization very fast relative to the changing business conditions. We can't have somebody working for a new boss every week. We also can't change our geographic organization very fast. Matter of fact, even slower than the management one. We can't be moving people around the country every week. But we can change an electronic organization like that. And what's starting to happen is, as we start to link these computers together with sophisticated networks and great user interfaces, we're starting to be able to create clusters of people working on a common task in a, you know, literally in 15 minutes worth of setup. And these 15 people can work together extremely efficiently no matter where they are geographically and no matter who they work for hierarchically. And these organizations can live for as long as they're needed and then vanish. And we're finding we can reorganize our companies electronically uh, very rapidly. And that's the only type of organization that can begin to keep pace with the changing business conditions. And I believe that this collaborative model has existed in higher education for a long time, but we're starting to see it applied into the commercial world as well. And this is going to be the third major revolution that these desktop computers provide, is revolutionizing human-to-human -human communication and group work. We call it interpersonal computing. In the 1980s, we did personal computing. 
Uh, and now we're going to extend that as we network these things to interpersonal computing. I, um, I saw my first computer when I was 12. And it was at uh, NASA. We had a local NASA center nearby. And it was a terminal which was connected to a big computer somewhere. And I got a time-sharing account on it. And I was fascinated by this thing. And I saw my second computer a few years later, which was really the first desktop computer ever made. It was made by Hewlett Packard. It's called the 9100A. And it ran a language called BASIC. And it was very large. Uh, had a very small cathode ray tube on it for display. And I got a chance to play with one of those maybe in 1968 or 9 and uh, spent every spare moment I had trying to write programs for it. I was so fascinated by this. Uh, and so I was probably fairly lucky in that my introduction to computers very rapidly moved from a terminal uh, to within maybe 12 months or so actually seeing a, the, one of the first, probably the first desktop computer ever, ever really produ produced. And uh, so my point of view never really changed from, from being able to get my arms around it, even though my arms probably didn't quite fit around that first one. So. I read somewhere that you had no intention of building a company. Mm -hmm. That you were just out to do stuff for yourselves, if you can give me. Right. I don't know what the question they asked to get that, but. Well, at the time we started Apple, um, Waz was working for Hewlett Packard. I was working for Atari, actually, for Nolan Bushnell designing video games. And uh, we, we went to Atari and showed them our early prototypes, and we went to HP. And we encouraged each company to hire the other one and let us do this for them. And we got, we got turned down in both places, uh, probably for good reasons. But uh, we started a company because it was the only alternative left, not because we wanted to. When did you ever think that it was gonna this was really going to happen, that this was going to go from just a, an interesting idea to... to Oh, it didn't take very long. It, it happened for me when I saw people that could never possibly design a computer, could never possibly build a hardware kit, could never possibly assemble their own keyboards and monitors, could never even write their own software using these things. Then you knew something very big was going to happen. When we got into that stage where we were high enough on the food chain, if you will, that uh, a lot of people could use these things, and they were really liking it. What do computer networks offer to education? Well, uh, you know, education's been on computer networks for longer than almost anyone else. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, has an office called DARPA, and they funded a thing called uh, ARPANET many, many years ago uh, to try to build a command and control network for military uh, uh, purposes. And they did a very brilliant thing. After they got a prototype working, they gave it to the university community in America and said, bang on this for a while and see if it works and m help us make it better. And after a few years of the university community doing that, they created a separate version uh, for military purposes. But they left the uh, educational version going. And that has tied together the research community of the United States now for about a decade and uh, is vital to the functioning of higher education in this country. Uh, so higher education has actually led the way. That's why we started off focusing exclusively on higher education, because where else could you find 5,000 people on a network but Carnegie Mellon University, as an example. So higher education has been five years ahead of business in using computers in some of these powerful new ways, which we're going to see now ripple into business in the first half of the 90s. It's pretty exciting. How about lower education? How about school? How about lower? Um, Sharing valuable resources? So far, uh, computer use in K through 12 has been primarily Apple IIs. And uh, I, wish, uh, I wish that uh, they'd been upgrading to Macintosh as faster than they have been. But I think, uh, I think that that's slowly happening, and IBM is, is getting in there as well. The primary purpose of computing in K through 12 has been just computer literacy. And um, there's been a bottleneck because there hasn't been enough sophisticated courseware written. And that's a problem for our society in general amongst all the other problems with our K-12 through education system. One could talk about that for a few days. Easily. So. <laughs> well, how did the PC change the world? Well, though the analogy is nowhere perfect, um, and, and certainly uh, one needs to factor out the environmental concerns of the, of the analogy as well, uh, there is a lot to be said for comparing it to going from trains, from passenger trains to automobiles. 
And uh, the advent of the automobile gave us a personal freedom of transportation. In the same way, uh, the advent of the computer gave us the ability to start to use computers without having to convince other people that we needed to use computers. And the biggest effect of the personal computer revolution has been to um, allow millions and millions of people to experience computers themselves uh, decades before they ever would have in the old paradigm and to allow them to uh, participate in uh, the making of choices and controlling their own destiny using these tools. But it has created, uh, it has created problems. And the largest problems are that uh, now that we have all these very powerful tools, we're still islands. And we're still not really connecting these people using these powerful tools together. And that's really been the challenge of the last few years and the next several years, is how to connect these things back together so that we can, can rebuild a fabric of these things rather than just individual points of light, if you will, and um, get the benefit of both the passenger train and the automobile. I'm part of this electronically connected community. Um, that's going to provide us wonderful new capabilities and, and uh, communications abilities, but we still always want to be able to disconnect that network spigot, take it off, and take our standalone computer somewhere, let's say home. Now, what's going to happen rapidly is with radio links and with fiber optics to the home, you're going to be able to hook your computer up to your network at home. Uh, but there's always going to be that cabin in the middle of nowhere that I want to go for a two-week vacation where I want my computer. And if it doesn't work in a completely standalone way, I'm, I'm going to be not happy. So we have to provide a fluid way for these things to kind of dock into the mother load network, but also undock and allow me as an individual to carry my computer up into Yosemite backpacking and where there's you know, no radio links and no fiber yeah. into the network and find out what happened when I left and share some of my thoughts maybe with some other folks. So we're working on that. That's our goal for the next five years is that seamless transition between the standalone computer and the computer as part of this network community. It also keeps away the Orwellian aspects of always being hooked into the network. Right. That's right. Um, now, I actually think what, what an interesting paradox is it is the network which is ultimately going to define and create the home computer market, not keeping our recipes on these things or something like we thought in 1975. Uh, being a part of that network and not being able to stay away from it while you're at home will drive people to get uh, computers in every house, just like we have a telephone in every house. Um, well, Xerox Park was a, a research lab set up by Xerox when they were making a lot of profits in the copier days. And uh, they were doing some computer science research, which was basically an extension of some stuff started by a guy named Doug Engelbart when he was at SRI. Doug had invented the mouse and invented the bitmap display. And, and some Xerox folks that, that Xerox, uh, I believe, hired away from Doug or split off from Doug somehow and got to Xerox were continuing along in, these, in this vein. And I first went over there in 1979. And I saw what they were doing with uh, the larger screens, uh, proportionally spaced text, uh, and the mouse. And it was just instantly obvious to anyone that this was the way things should be. Um, and so I remember coming back to Apple thinking, our, our future has just changed. This is where we have to go. The problem was that Xerox had never made a commercial computer. This group of people at Xerox was, was, uh, was more concerned with, with uh, looking out 15 years than they were looking out 15 months and trying to make a product that somebody could use. So there were a lot of issues that they hadn't solved, like menus and other things like that. And at Apple, what we had to do was to do two things. One was complete the research, which really was only about 50% complete. And the second was to find a way to implement it at a low enough cost where people would buy it. And that, that was really our challenge. What did you su succeed in doing with the Mac? Well, the Macintosh, as you remember when it came out, we called it the computer for the rest of us. And what that meant was uh, that while experts could use some of the computers that were already out, most people didn't want, the, again, the computer was, was not an end in itself. It was a means to an end. And so most people didn't want to learn how to use the computer. They just wanted to use it. 
And the Macintosh was supposed to be the computer for people that just wanted to use a computer without having to learn how to use one, spent six months. Now, it turned out that the, the paradox was that to make a computer easier to use, you needed a more powerful computer in the first place because you were going to burn a lot of the cycles on making it easy to use. And so this computer that was easy to use was actually more powerful and could do more things than the less easy to use computer. And it took people a few years to figure that out about the Macintosh, but I think, uh, I think people did. Actually, there's a funny joke that we were conning around one day, and one of our group is an IBM person. Uh -huh. And so I was saying, you know, some little girl walks up and sees a prompt yeah. and goes to her daddy and says, it's broken. You know, where's my desktop? Mm -hmm. You know, where's, where's my metaphor? And, and we've gotten, we've, we've adopted this new metaphor. What, how has that changed the look of computers? Well, I think, I think the Macintosh was created by a group of people who felt that uh, there wasn't a strict division between sort of science and, and art. Or in other words, that mathematics is really a liberal art if you look at it from a slightly different point of view. And why can't we interject typography into computers? Why can't we have computers uh, uh, talking to us in, in English language? And uh, Looking back five years later, this seems like a trivial observation, but at the time it was cataclysmic in its consequences, and the battles that were fought to push this point of view out the door were very large. The um, balance between thinking and doing. I mean, one of the things in the semiconductors was you had risk takers. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bob Noyce you know, learns Absolutely. to hang glide at age 40. You know? uh -huh. I mean, these people like laying their butts in the line. How important was that in the early days? I mean, we're going back to 75. Huh. Well, again, after seeing... No. Uh, my entire life's been spent only in one industry, which is this one. And, uh, but I've been in it now for about 15 years, and I've seen a lot of people make a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people fail a lot of things. And my, my point of view on this, or my observation, is that the doers are the major thinkers. Uh, the people that really create the things that change this industry are both the thinker-doer in one person. And if we really go back and we examine, uh, you know, did, did Leonardo have a guy off to the side that was thinking five years out in the future what he would paint or the technology he would use to paint it? Of course not. Leonardo was the artist, but he also mixed all his own paints. He also was a, a fairly good chemist, knew about pigments, uh, knew about human anatomy, and combining all of those skills together, the art and the science, the thinking and the doing, was what resulted in the exceptional result. And there is no difference in our industry. The people that have really made the contributions have been the thinkers and the doers. And when you, when you, uh, a lot of people, of course, it's, it's very easy to take credit for the thinking. Uh, the doing is more concrete. But somebody, it's very easy for somebody to say, oh, I thought of this three years ago. But uh, usually when you dig a little deeper, you find that the people that really did it were also the people that really worked through the hard intellectual problems as well. Focusing now on the third program, where we've gone from semiconductors, and the vision is IBM is this big machine, Univac, big large machine, and we take the, the line through of integrated circuit microprocessor. And we actually got some great stuff from Ted Hoff mm -hmm. about, you know, it's, it's a light bulb. You know, you you, it burns out, you replace it. Yeah. You know? um, then we lead up into the beginnings of the personal computer. So what were you doing at the time, and, and how did that get started? Um. Actually, you know, it wasn't Intel that first figured out that the microprocessor was a computer. They designed these things to be used in calculators. And they thought the reason that the microprocessor came about was they thought if they could design a slightly programmable one, the next customer that walked in the door that wanted a slightly different calculator, they could just spend a few months rather than a few years designing a new piece of silicon. But I think the thought of making a computer never really occurred to them. And it was the hobbyists that thought about making a computer that thought about making a computer out of these things it was this it was the computer hobbyist community that, that first did that uh, and I don't think Intel quite understood that for a few years um, but again the first thing that happened was these people came together and formed a club the homebrew computer club at Stanford was the first one in the country and uh, it, it, it was a beehive of all of these people who were interested in these small little computers 
people that might have been ham radio operators, uh, people that might have you know worked with large computers, uh, were all gathered together to uh, share, discuss their uh, their latest little projects. It was very exciting, and it, there was not a month that would go by where some breakthrough didn't happen. And then the first magazine came along, which was Byte Magazine, to communicate uh, on a national scale with all these hobbyists. So that uh, it was a very, very exciting, dynamic time. What did I think when I saw yeah, the Apple we, we first saw that, that Waz was building that, that board. Well, it didn't quite work that way, actually. Okay. What happened was, was that Waz and I uh, had known each other since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And we built, uh, our first project together was we built these little blue boxes to uh, make free telephone calls. And uh, we had the best blue box in the world. It was this all digital little blue box. I don't think it works anymore, so. Uh, but uh, we, had a, we had a fun time doing that. So when it came to building a computer together, um, Waz focused mostly, Waz was the brilliant hardware engineer and focused on the core design of the computer. And uh, I was worrying about which parts we ought to use and how we were going to build these things and how a, sort of a, somebody that wasn't a Waz was going to manage to buy all the extra parts you still needed to buy and plug this thing together because you still needed to buy your own keyboard and your own display and your own power supply. And, and uh, so you needed to be pretty much of a hardware hobbyist. Now, we made the, a, a very important decision was to not offer our computers a kit. Even though you needed to buy these extra parts, the, the main computer board itself came fully assembled. We were the first company in the world to do that. Everybody else was offering their little computers a kit. And what that meant was, was there was maybe an order of magnitude more people who could actually buy our computer and use it than if they had to build it themselves. And the Apple II was actually the first computer to come fully assembled, where you didn't have to do anything. And the reason there was it was our observation that for every hardware hobbyist, someone who could either build the kit themselves or at least find these five or ten extra parts they needed, there were a thousand potential software hobbyists. And if they didn't have to do anything with the hardware except use it, make, and at that time that meant write their own programs, still there was a much larger group of people that could take advantage of this. So we wanted to reach them and that was the, the real breakthrough in the Apple II. The, um, the first face-to-face uh, -face gathering of personal computer hobbyists from all around the country was this show put on in Atlantic City in 1976. And it was in the basement of some dingy hotel. And it just happened to be about 300 degrees outside. <laughs> so the basement was, it was like a steam bath. And it was impossible to be down there for longer than a half an hour without being completely drenched. And nevertheless, there were a few hundred hobbyists completely drenched walking around for hours. And we had a little tiny booth there. It was, was a tablecloth over a, over, over a hotel table. And there were th Waz and I and a friend or two of ours went there. And we had our few Apple Ones there and a little poster we'd made. And that was really our first, uh, the first computer show in, in the, in the, uh, the world. A year later, I think uh, maybe maybe even nine months later, there was the first West Coast Computer Fair, which was a much more professional operation by com in comparison with Atlantic City, but still very very uh, hobby oriented compared with what goes on today. And that was in San Francisco, and there were maybe a uh, hundred uh, companies showing their wares, and it was attended by maybe a thousand people, which was a lot for our industry at that time. Thirteen. Thirteen thousand. Wow, really? Thirteen thousand people. That's a lot. That's Jim Warren told me that. That's a lot. I, I'd be surprised at that, but maybe he Call knows better than that. I do. 6,000. Yeah, 6,000. Thousands of people. And um, that's when we introduced the Apple II. And uh, I think the Apple II was probably the hit of the show at that, that time.